Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this evening, isn't it? No place I'd rather be. If you would, turn with me to Philippians chapter number 4 this evening. The uh, Lord's uh, played something on my heart. He's uh, given me a fairly long introduction compared to what I normally have, but I uh, believe it's important. So, uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 19 is where we're going to start. And that reads, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you look up at verse 13 there of Philippians 4, it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, take and flip backwards a couple pages. We're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to see one more thing. Ephesians chapter number 4 and verse 4 says, There is one body. And one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now listen to this. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your many blessings. Lord, I, I pray that you would meet with us here tonight, Lord. I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit. You'd fill this place with your spirit, Lord. I pray that you'd... Have me say what I need to say, Lord, and that the things that I don't need to say, we'd leave them out. Hide me behind the cross, Lord, that it be your words and not mine. Lord, I pray that you'd help us here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Title of tonight's message is, When Jesus is all that I have, He's all that I need. Now, the Lord has been dealing with me on this. There was a song that I was listening to, and I just I started to think about this. When Jesus really is all we have, we shouldn't need anything else. So over and over and over again, I played this song for probably a week straight. And what ended up happening is, is I play it at least once a day. I want to remember that Jesus is all that I need. And if I remember that, then I'm going to be looking for the things of the Lord. So with the Lord laying these verses on my heart, that's the subject for tonight. When Jesus is all that I have, he's all that I need. Uh, my prayer here tonight is that we get us some encouragement from this and that we get something to take away and that we're, we're going to see this truth that God has laid out for us in his book. There's not nothing new here that we're going to talk about. It's not nothing fancy. It's sure it's something that we've all heard, but there are three words that we want to look at real quick to start out. All have need. Those three words that it was, I was looking at this title, they were interesting and they were in that order, right? So when you think of the phrase all have need, the question comes to mind, who or what do they need? Well, the definition of all by standard definition means everything nothing left behind all must be a part of something so we all that means no soul left behind out of this all peoples have a need which according to webster's 1828 tells us that need means to have uh to possess no excuse me have means to possess need is a lack of or requirement then you add jesus all have need of jesus right so now we have the purpose of life One thing is very clear. We all need Jesus, and without the shedding of his perfect, holy, precious blood, none of us could see heaven. Amen. Amen. The verse we opened with wanted to establish the point that God has emphasized. Jesus is all that we need. God is all that we need. The Holy Spirit is all that we need. And then you add in your Bible reading and prayer, you've got everything you could ever want in this life. All wrapped up in one little package there. Without God, we wouldn't have mercies that were new every day. Without God, he could just wipe us off the face of this planet and say, I'm done with him. It's his time to go. Without God, I'm bound for a place called hell. Without God, I'm destined to fail and to fall and to crumble under my own sins because I'm a wicked person without God. With God, I have his righteousness imparted to me, thank the Lord. But without him, I am nothing but wicked flesh condemned to die. Without God, we'll crumble under these weights. So these weights would be like somebody pouring concrete around your feet and around your ankles and then trying to toss you over into a river. You're going to drown because you're not going to be able to pull yourself up. That's this weight of sin. There's nothing we can do to pull ourselves up out of that sin except to come to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We need Jesus in this life. He needs to be our all. And if we have the proper order in our lives, Jesus will truly be all that we ever have need of. And we'll be satisfied. We'll be thankful for everything that we have. 
will be full, and not only full, but I love what the psalmist said in Psalm 23, my cup runneth over. I'll keep drinking from my saucer, Lord. You just keep pouring off my cup. Hmm. If we have the proper order in our life, it should be easy for Jesus to be all that we'll ever need. First and foremost, we need to talk about this prevailing trait that we're missing in today's society, which is love. The Bible says that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And the second is like unto it, which is to love our neighbor as ourselves. I'm so tired of hearing graceless Christianity and people are just beating people up out in the world. Well, we don't want to come to church. We've heard about you all. All y'all do is tear people down. All y'all do is judge people. If I'm giving you the word of God, I'm not judging you. God is. I don't have to judge you. I don't have anything in me that can judge anybody. I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. But what I do have is I have the Lord Jesus Christ to share with others because he is all that we need. So if we share that same love with others and we, we give out what God has given into us. I got ahead of myself here. I do apologize. So love. Love is the message here, right? Christians are either skipping the scripture when they come to this or they read it and they think, hey, it's not talking to me. This isn't for me. Maybe God was speaking to somebody else in this particular passage when he's talking about love. <clears throat> Christians, modern Christians today, they talk about love, but they don't know what it is. They talk about the love of God. They talk about, I've been born again. I've been saved. Or they talk about, hey, I go to church. I'm a good person. I help out. I've been given the homeless food. I've been given where I can to help others in need. And that's great. But that doesn't do anything for our salvation. That doesn't do anything to help them to understand the true love of God that's in me. And if I have the love of God in me, it should just be as easy to share it as me talking Amen. to you right now. Amen. I don't just want to make blanket statements. Not all Christians are this way. Not everybody doesn't understand the love of God. But the love of God should be important to us. Because Jesus, when he moved into our heart, there wasn't any room for anything else. It was Jesus or it was the world. You're either going to love Jesus and you're the things of Jesus, or you're going to love the world and the things of the world. So it gets old hearing about graceless Christianity, but it also gets old hearing people talk about each other. Amen. Christians are quick to beat each other down and talk about somebody when they're in their time of need. How about we edify them? How about we lift them up? How about we share some scripture with them and people will respond better. You think about that. I'm showing love by saying, hey, brother, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, and so can you. Amen. God gave us that promise. Amen. That's all it takes. It just takes a little edifying, a little lifting up. Thank you very much. So let's get to lifting people up. i got to tell you all, it's been refreshing. Dear brother right here has been nothing but an encouragement to me since we've been over here, and it's been a blessing. And it's an encouragement, and it's refreshing to see that there are Christians that are willing to edify and lift up and not just tear people down. There's something about being in God's house. Yeah. Yeah. Men and women alike who want to hear the word of God, who hunger and thirst after the things of God. God said those people are blessed. Let's hunger for the word of God. You know, Brother Josh made mention Wednesday night of just walking into the doors of church. And that really hit home with me too because when you are excited to be in the house of God, hey, you're going to learn something. You're going to get something. Hey, I'm excited to walk in those doors because I know that there's going to be a preacher that's going to give me the word. I'm going to hear some singing that's going to lift my soul up and stir my soul with the Holy Spirit. Mm. Got to love going to church. Got to love that Jesus is in the place that we meet, that God is in the place that we meet. And I'm so thankful that I brought the Holy Spirit in with me. <laughs> Everywhere I go, the Holy Spirit is with me. If Jesus is what gets you stirred, soul stirred up and motivated he can give you one of the greatest outlooks you can ever have on life Jesus is all that we need some find this a burden some find it difficult for them to, to follow Jesus and they wonder why why are others getting blessed why is it so and so has such a great life and why is it they seem to always have the blessings poured out on them and here I am I can't figure out what's going on it's me standing in the need of prayer it's me standing in the time where I need to get on my knees and repent and cry out to God for whatever it is that's wrong in my life yep. if God's not blessing me there's a reason for it if God doesn't talk to me and speak to me and I feel like I've gone without him for a week on end let alone however much time I should feel something's wrong Hey, I need to repent. I need to get on my knees. I need to figure out what's going on so that God can have that relationship with me again. That I can have that relationship with God. <clears throat> if you're sitting in a service 
And everybody around you seems to be stirred up. Everybody around you seems to be getting something out of it. And you're the only one that's not. That's another time to get on our knees and cry out and say, Lord, why am I not getting anything? Speak to me, Lord. I want to I know what it is. Show me. Reveal it to me so that I can fix it and fix the problem. Cry out to God. Ask for mercy. Ask for forgiveness for whatever sin you may have in your life. Cry out and ask Him. Lord, if there be anything sinful in my life. You know how simple that is? If there be anything sinful in my life, please reveal it to me and please forgive me of it so that we can have a right relationship. It's that simple. Please show me what I need to avoid to have a proper relationship with you. Now this is very important for our prayers here because when we talk to God, when we cry out to Him and we ask Him, what is it, Lord, that you need from me? This is what we need to do right here. Amen. Stop. Take a breath. Don't say a word. Just listen. Be still and let God speak to you because we're talking to Him we expect God to talk back to us. Now, it's not probably going to be an audible voice like you're hearing from me, but God speaks to the heart. God speaks through his word. God does things to stir us up so that we know we're in the right place at the right time. I'll share a quick testimony with you all. I'll never forget it as long as I live. I got out of church for a little while. When I was in the military, I decided that I was just going to, I was going to rebel. I wasn't going to listen to what my mom had to say anymore. I wasn't going to go to church. So for years... My mom kept bugging me. She's like, come to church with me this morning. Come to church with me this morning. She never quit. And I just gave her excuse after excuse after excuse, right? Well, during this time frame that I'm giving her excuses, I'm watching a show on TV. And this show made me question a lot of the things that I knew from the Bible. So my first thought was, hey, I'm going to go pick up my Bible that's got dust all over it. I'm going to dust it off and I'm going to read it. I want to find out what's going on and why I'm not remembering this the right way. So I started writing stuff out. Everything that I was reading, I started writing my thoughts out to it. So when mom finally convinced me to go to church with her again, and I finally got tired of giving her excuses and I went, in order, the very first three sermons that I heard from this preacher was exactly what I had wrote down, in order. Amen. It was amazing. And that's not just coincidence. Three times, I mean, you can't tell, one time you can say coincidence. Three times you can't tell me coincidence. Amen. Fast forward, we've gone to a church that we had gone to in the past, and we hadn't really raised my daughter in church at this time, so it was kind of like this, you know, uh, she didn't really know how to behave properly in church and everything. Well, she was gone at her other grandma's house, <clears throat> and while she was gone, we decided to pay a visit to this old church that we went to, and again, in order, what I've been writing about. First three sermons I heard. Now this time was even better because I'd actually told my mom what I'd been writing about and what I'd been studying on. So she's like elbowing me in the middle of the service like, you hearing this? You know, they're talking about what you... The Lord speaks to us in amazing ways. He'll tell you when you're in the right place at the right time. He'll put it on your heart to let you know exactly what it is that he wants from you. You just got to listen. And that's something that seems non-existent today. We're, we're in such a hurry. We're so quick to just run off. We want, oh, Lord, I've I got to go to work. I'm on my way to work. i got to get out to the car. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time for my Bible reading. If I don't have time for that, then I don't have time for anything else in this life. If I don't have time to make time for Jesus, then what else is it that I have that's so important that I need to do and get Amen. done? When Jesus is all that I have, he should be all that I need. Shouldn't need anything else in this life. That's not saying that we don't have things that we have need of, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. But we're always in such a hurry, and we say quick prayers like, Lord, thank you for this food. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But, hey, how about we take the time to stop and be thankful? God's given us all this that he's given us food, he's given us a home, he's given us a place to sit and eat, he's given us silverware and plates. What more could we possibly need in this life that Jesus hadn't already provided for us? Hmm. Nothing wrong with a prayer like that, but it lacks the depth, and it lacks what seems to be true faith-filled prayer. Sure. Hey, I want to ask a blessing for my meal when the Lord has provided it for me, but I think the Lord deserves a little bit better from me than, Lord, thank you for the meal. You know, that, that's pretty simple and to the point. I'm not suggesting that either that you pray for three hours before your meal. We, we don't want a cold meal, but we also want to make sure that we give the Lord the proper thanks. That's what we're getting at here. I'm grateful. Let's take a little time and say, Lord, I'm grateful. I'm thankful for what you've done for me. Life is truly too short to rush through, so let us enjoy what God's given us. Let us sit down and enjoy and be thankful 
for the things and, and, and for what he does. Even the song on your heart, be thankful for that. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Did we just discover the first step to being in the will of God? My word. If we just gave thanks for every single thing, we'd never have another minute to do anything else in this life because we'd be thankful for every single thing that God has given us. Amen. We should be. Amen. Isn't it funny that God says that all of our needs should be supplied? Yeah. He didn't say, Brother Josh, I'm just going to supply one or two of your needs. Right. Hey, I'm only going to give you three wishes and I'm going to be like a genie in a bottle. No, he didn't say that. I'm thankful he didn't say it. He said he supply all of our needs. So i got to trust that God is going to give me what I need on a day-to-day -day basis. Thankful that he didn't say that it was just one or two. I'm thankful that all means all, and that he's not a part-time God, that he's a God that's always there. Every time I cry out to him, he's always faithful. You know, we have many earthly needs, but when we discover Jesus, we discovered our future. Before we get to our points, I want us to see some examples in the Bible of people who followed the same line of thinking. Abraham proved that God was all he needed. Why? Because he picked up, packed up, and took off. God said, just go. And he went. He didn't know where he was going. And he was going for a city that was built by God, whose builder and maker is God. And I can tell you I'm thankful that God's the one that built it. Because if my human hands built something like heaven, it would crumble with time. But God says that there's a place that's made with hands that aren't human hands. 2 Corinthians 5, I believe, is the, the scripture. But he's made this place that's not going to be destructible. It's never going to leave. It's never going to crumble. It's never going to fall. And we're going to be with him for time and eternity. So thankful that we have people like Abraham there. But then you see, what about uh, <clears throat> Joseph? Joseph was a man that proved that God was all he needed. Through all the trials, through all the tribulations, through all the things that he went through in his life, he stuck by God. He never quit. He never gave up. He never once left God. How about Elijah? He proved through his walk with God and how he prayed that God was truly all that he needed. David. David trusted in the Lord for all things. Everything he had, he trusted in the Lord. And even in his time of need, when he knew that he was in the wrong and he knew that he had fallen away from God after sinning with Bathsheba, has the wherewithal to, to sit down and humble himself and write the 51st Psalm. <laughs> Created me a clean heart, O God. Renew in me a right spirit. Restore the joy of thy salvation unto me. If you're here tonight and that joy has been taken from you, you're the only one that can take it. God doesn't take it away. Satan can't take it from you because God gave it to you. You're the only one that can set your joy aside and say, I don't want it right now. <clears throat> what about Paul? I think this scripture speaks very loudly of Paul saying, when Jesus is all that I have, he's all that I need. Philippians 3, 7 says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of, which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death, if by any means that I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Paul was willing to throw everything away and count it as dung just so that he could know Jesus Christ, just so he could have him, just so he could be filled with the Spirit and walk with God. <laughs> For time's sake, there's just a few that we wanted to mention, but these people were totally dependent on God for everything that they needed. If we're not dependent on Jesus for our needs, then we'll look to self, or maybe we'll look to family, but then we're not looking to Jesus to help us. We're not looking for the right help and seeking out the place that we actually need it from. I'll be the first to tell you that I believe in the power of prayer, and prayer should be a number one priority for us, because I've seen firsthand what prayer can do. Hey, I've seen personally what, firsthand what prayer can do, but I tell you what's even better. You get you a buddy to pray with, you get you somebody who you know loves the Lord and they want to reach out and 
get a hold of the Lord and they're going to do everything they can while they're crying out to just get in contact with him, that's the kind of person you need to find to pray with. And I promise you, what you'll find too is that when two touch something here on earth, the Lord's listening. The Lord's going to respond to it. I've seen it firsthand. I know it works. Mm. <laughs> you know what's amazing is that God listens. What are we? Speck of dirt. And yet this great God in heaven who created the heavens and the earth and the stars and he created everything that we've ever known, this great God in heaven just lends his ear so he can hear what I've got to say. That ought to make us feel special inside. Because I'm nothing. I'll tell you, I'm nothing without the Lord. I'm nothing. And I want to be a nothing. But I want him and his righteousness and what he has for me in this life. Jesus didn't just go die on a cross to then ignore your prayers. He went and died on the cross so that we could gain access to the throne. And we could come boldly before the throne of grace with the prayers that we have need of. I can tell you if you're sitting here right now and you haven't been putting Jesus first in your life, if you're sitting here right now and you're lost and you're saying, Preacher, what are you talking about? This altar's open. I won't count it as a disruption. I'll count it as a, hey, let's stop and pray. Let's get right with God. If you've got something that you need to deal with the Lord on, let the Lord do business with you. Let the Holy Spirit work. If he's pushing you, follow him. Listen to it. Don't wait. Don't put off for later what's pressing now because time right now is pressing. The Bible says redeem the time because there's wickedness. There's evil that is in our day right now. We don't have time. If you're lost and undone, you certainly don't have time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You don't know when your last breath's going to be. Amen. For those of you that don't know, I work with a mortuary service. I see death every day, and people say, well, you know, death is, uh, death is for the old people. Death ain't just for the old people. You never know when you're going to take your last breath. We could go out here and get in our vehicles tonight and leave here and die on the highway on the way home. We never know. I've seen young, I've seen old, it don't matter. God says when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Amen. Don't put off for later what's pressing now, because you may not have that other opportunity. We never know when our number is going to be called. And Jesus is all that I have. He's all that I need. I know that was a long introduction, but I believe now that we'll be able to see what it is we want to look at here tonight. Let's look at Colossians chapter number 3, if you would turn over there with me. This is our main text for this evening. Uh, Colossians chapter number 3. And we're going to look at verse 1 here. It says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. When Jesus is all that I have, he's all that I need, right? I'm seeking those things that are above. I'm looking, setting our affection on the things that are above, not on the things of earth. For you're dead. And your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is, your, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. What a day that'll be. Then we go on to say, Mortify therefore also your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for, the, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh, on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man and his deeds. And ye have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, Circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free. Here we go again. But Christ is all and in all. Christ is all that we need. I'm trying to make this point. I hope you all see this tonight. This is what the Lord laid on my heart to make a point of. Christ has to be all that we need. When he's all that we have, he will be all that we need. Amen. So number one, we see from the old man to the new man. Right? Right? So there's a few things that I see here, and the first one is seek and set our affections on the things of above. How many remember the, the campaign that used to be uh, WWJD? They'd give out bracelets, and they'd say, what would Jesus do? 
Well, I'm here to tell you, if we're in tune with the Lord, we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, and we're walking after the Spirit, we don't need to think about what would Jesus do because we're already walking after Him. We're already walking in that right spirit. So we're going to know what it is that Jesus wants us to do. And I believe that with all my heart. That thought won't even cross your mind because you'll know what's right and what's wrong at that particular time. But when we're out of the will of God, we seem to question things more. We seem to question whether or not things are right in our life and why they are. We must be heavenly minded, but not so heavenly minded that we're no good here on earth. We've still got souls to reach. There's still souls that are lost and dying and going to hell. And the moment we walk through those doors, I, the best thing that I've ever seen in my life, there's a little church where we live in the town that we live in. And as you pull onto their property, there's a sign that says, now entering the mission training field. As you leave, that very sign on the backside says, now entering the mission field. We need to remember that. We come in here to get filled up. We come in here to hear about the Lord and the things of the Lord. And we go out and we get to share what we've learned. Remember the time before Jesus saved your soul from a place called hell? You were lost without hope. Along came Jesus. Knocked on your door and said, I want to come in. We're set our eyes on the things of above. We're to look to the author and finisher of our faith who is Jesus Christ. One thing that I just couldn't get away from in verse 3. This old flesh is what? It's dead according to verse 3. And our life is hid in Christ. So right now, you cannot see that I'm saved. But I promise you one day I'm going to prove it when I'm up there standing in heaven because I know my name's written in the Lamb's book of life. My life is hid in Christ. And I get to share Christ with everyone else. I couldn't get past that when I read it. I don't know why. <clears throat> but when we're saved, you know this old man's still wrapped around us. We're, unfortunately, we have to deal with this old man, this flesh, until the day we die. But we need to trust what's on the inside if we're saved. We need to trust the Holy Spirit who abides within us to give us what we need. When you die, you will prove that there's a real heaven and there's a real hell. Why? Because that's one of two places that you're going to go. You're either going to go to heaven or go to hell. This old body has to die, and after that, that's where you're going to end up. There is no ceasing to exist. I had a preacher friend of mine talk to me about uh, the NIV and was talking about in Revelation 22, there is a scripture that talks about how when you take anything out of the book, the yeah. Bible says that he's going to take away our part from the Lamb's yeah. book of life. right? Well, the NIV says he's going to take away your part from the tree of life. Well, guess what? If anybody's done any studying and they understand the tree of life, they go back to Genesis. The tree of life was guarded by a cherubim with a flaming sword. Why? Because it was a tree that made them live forever. You have no part of the tree of life. You have no part in heaven. It's amazing that even, even in them trying to dumb it down for people, they're still pointing out what is, what is right. I'm not suggesting that we look at the NIV. I'm just saying you can't change words. Words matter. If you cease to exist, you know, no big deal, right? Well, what's the, what's the consequences? Well, there's a hell that's very real. And that's why people don't want you to know. That's why Satan doesn't want you to know, because he wants you to be there. Yeah. Yeah. You're here today and you're not sure about salvation. The Bible tells us that there are none righteous, no, not one, and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I can tell you that God has given us a completely free gift, but you must take that gift. Romans 10, 9 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in that heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Amen. It's that simple. This is where we start to set our affection on the things of the Lord. This is the time when we get saved. Now, hey, pressing forward, we're putting everything we've got towards the Lord. That's what we should be doing as we want to grow in Christ and grow as a Christian. And if you remember, like I was saying earlier about David, if you've had your joy stolen, if you've let your joy go and you, you want to remember what it was like when God first met with you, when God first knocked on the door of your heart, cry out to Him. Ask the Lord to restore that joy of the salvation because you, you're missing it. If you notice here in this passage in Colossians 3, it also talks about what we used to do. In verse 5 it says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness which are idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God come on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them. We lived them at one point in time. There was a point in time in our life where we were not saved. 
And all these things were things that we needed to get rid of. And we need to take our focus away from the old things. And we're going to look at the new here in a minute. But what we know here is that these are characteristics that we lived at some point. Every saved, born-again believer has a past. If you say you don't have a past or you've never sinned, you're deceiving your own self. If you're around somebody that says, I've never sinned in my life or I haven't sinned since the day I got saved, turn around and walk away. Don't, don't hang around with somebody that's going to tell you that they've never sinned because they're deceiving themselves. <laughs> so, if we say we have no sin, we have not only deceived ourselves, but we blaspheme God by calling Him a liar as well. So when we get saved, we can see from verse 5 in Colossians, it said that we're to mortify our members here on earth. So what do we do? We subdue them to bring them into subjection uh, as bodily ap appetites by abstinence or <clears throat> to subdue to abase, to humble, to reduce, to restrain, as in ordinate passions. We have things in this life that we're passionate about. We're always going to have things that we want to do. But if our mind is focused on Jesus, our mind is focused on when Jesus is all that I have, he's all that I need, our life will be on the right path. Amen. He's the one we need to look to. Mortify thy learned lust. Mortify, get rid of it, subdue it, put it away. <clears throat> Mortify the sins that hinder our relationship with God. Our old flesh likes to chase around the pleasures of sin for a season, and every now and then you'll find yourself getting caught up telling a story about the good old days, right? The days that we lived in sin. And the problem is, is that your flesh gets a kick out of that. Why is that? Because your flesh no longer gets to live in sin when you're born again. If you are truly looking after the things of God, we will sin as we go through this life. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that <clears throat> there's always going to be things we've got to deal with. There's always going to be things that come up. The question is, are we going to, if we fall, are we going to repent and get up and keep going and ask the Lord to forgive us and keep trying? Because I know that I'm going to have to keep trying until the day I die as far as repenting and just even thoughts. Thoughts are a huge thing. You're driving down the road, somebody cuts you off, first thing you do is, you know, you're upset with that person. Well, you know, that's something that we got to get into subjection. Make no mistake about it. Satan's going to lay the most enticing baits out that he can. He does that so he can get us to be an ineffective Christian. The Bible says to abstain from even the appearance of evil. I don't even want to be around the appearance of it. Mm. So we put off the old man. Now we're going to see, put off the old man for Jesus. And now we see what? When Jesus is all that I have. Let's look at verse 11 here in Colossians 3. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you're called in one body. Be ye thankful. Amen. There's that word thankful again. Boy, that just keeps showing up, doesn't it? I think God's trying to tell us something about being thankful. Amen. I was talking with dear brother earlier. You know, we tend to grumble and complain and gripe at the things of this life, and it, it's so easy to say, well, you know, I, like my head's hurting. My head's been hurting all day. It's so easy to say, I got a migraine, I'm going to quit. I'm just going to go, I'm going to lay in bed all night, and that's it. You know, and most times it is that way for me. But when God's given me a task, that's one thing that I've learned. No matter how I feel, if God's given me the task to do, I do it. Because God gives the increase. Jesus is all that I have, and I want him to be all that I need. Now, <clears throat> we didn't deal with the last part of verse 11 before. So before we go any further... I want to look at that, uh, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, and we saw that, and then we see Christ is all and in all in verse 11 here. So that kind of puts in perspective what we've been talking about tonight. Christ is in everything that's around us. When we're looking for Christ, we're going to find him. Yeah. When you look, you'll find his handiwork out here. You'll find things that are just absolutely amazing that he has done. So... When Jesus is all that I have, we'll be a new creature in Christ. We put off the old man and the things that the old man used to do. And while we never get rid of this flesh and this life, we'll, we'll contend with it till the day we die. This old man is tested daily from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed. So 
we look at the things that are mentioned in this verse about being a new man. Mercy. Christians are known by the mercy we show. We're known, if we show somebody mercy, they're going to say, hey, why did they do that? They should have punished me. They should have dealt with me accordingly, but they didn't. They showed me mercy. Why? I didn't deserve that. Being of a humble mind, being kind, having meekness, long-suffering, and forgiving others. These are the characteristics that we see that Christ has given us for the new man. And we focus in on that because Jesus is all we have. So we're looking at those characteristics of Jesus and we're trying to be like Him. We're following Him. We've got to take up our cross and follow Him daily. <clears throat> Some of them won't be easy to carry out. Some of it won't be easy to be nice to people and learn how to love people the right way. But all that was because of disobedience. All that was because we're naturally at enmity with God. <clears throat> when God saves us through the blood, we are given a new life inside of us that's hidden Christ. And one thing that I'll promise you, if you make Jesus your only need, everything else in your life will fall into place. The rest of your life will be in order. The things that you want, yes, there are things that we have that are wants that God answers for us. But guess what? If we had our priorities in order to begin with, those things that we want will be the things of God. Those things that we want will be lined up with Jesus and what he has for us. It doesn't mean that we're going to be you know, getting rich or have great health, but it does mean that we'll have a peace that passes all understanding. It means that you'll have comfort in knowing where you're going when you die. You can know that there's a place that's so much better than here that God's prepared for us. You can have peace in your heart, a pep in your step, and people will notice that something's different about you. What's going on with Brother So-and-so? What, what, what's, what's going on with him? He's just different. He's a different kind of person. He's happy all the time. He's singing. He's doing things. And people take note of that. I like being different. I like being a nobody. I like when I can just say, you know, I, I, I don't want my name up in lights. I don't need my name posted somewhere to say, look at him. Look how big he is. I like being a nothing because I don't have to worry about people's expectations. I only have to worry about his. <laughs> So we apply these characteristics to our life, and our life will get a little bit easier when we realize that Jesus is what we need. We tend to live a life full of idols. Now, two of the big ones that I noticed were sports and shopping. Those are two of the biggest things, and we're, we're covering both, male and female. We could cover a whole bunch, but let's just look at these two for a minute. We could say that things are what we like. We like to have things. We like to go out and shop. And we, like, we saw a little knick-knack in Walmart. Hey, that would look really cool on my desk. Maybe I should buy that. What about sports, too? You think about sports. Hey, we get so wrapped up, we can go and watch a game, and you, you see all these people cheering. And some of those same people who might be Christians, they could cheer. They're at the ball game on Saturday, and then on Sunday when they come to church, just as quiet as they can be. Sitting there with arms crossed. Oh, bless me if you can. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Are sports themselves harmful to the Christian? No. Is shopping harmful to the Christian? No. When things have you, that's when there's a problem. That's when they become idols because these things are things that you have to have and you place them above the things of the Lord. Mm. If you want to watch a team play a sport and you can't live without them, you got to have a bunch of trinkets in your house and, and you can't get rid of them. You can't live without them. That's when we're living dangerously. Certainly no legalist, and I'm sure somebody watching this will probably say, well, you know, he's saying that things are bad. I'm not saying things are bad. I'm not saying either way. What I am saying is this. This is what I'm telling you. When Jesus is all that you have, he should be all that you ever need. You shouldn't need anything more in this life to satisfy you other than the Lord God himself. And having a loving attitude, being kind, humble, meek, lowly, and a servant of God will help you in that and showing people that Jesus is all that you need. We must learn to listen to the Word of God and apply it to our lives. We must make a habit of making Jesus all that we have so that we never have a need of anything. But preacher, a need will always arise. Yeah, you're right. Needs will always arise. But you know what? God already knows about them. All you got to do is send that prayer up. God already knows. He's ready to respond and answer. He supplies our needs. So lastly, I want to look at the results of this. And we're going to close with this. So verse 16 in Colossians 3 tells us, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Here we go again, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. First result is wisdom. You know, we think of Solomon. When, when God came to Solomon, Solomon could have asked for anything he wanted. Yeah. And what did he say? Lord, I want wisdom. I want to be able to lead my people. I want to be able to lead this people that you've placed in front of me, Lord. I just want wisdom. When we want the things of God, the things of God will come to us. The Bible says, draw nigh to God and I'll draw nigh to you. Yeah. That's what God tells us, right? So what do we do? We purify our hands. We do the things that God has asked us to do to get closer to Him. We get in His Word. We read about it. And from that comes His wisdom. God gives the wisdom to those who are seeking it. We just need to be humble enough in that approach. <clears throat> we see other results are songs, hymns, and psalms as well. Get a song in your heart. There might be a time when you're, you're just singing randomly for nothing. And the Lord's put that song on your heart. It's amazing how many times during the day that I, I come across a song that I haven't listened to in forever, or that you know, I've not sang in church in a while, and that song's just on my heart over and over and over again because it's something the Lord's placed there. Uh, verses as well. We share verses with others, and that's, that's when Jesus is all that we have. We'll be able to share those verses. We'll be able to share those songs. We can get a musician up here. Uh, we'll be doing all for Christ. We'll be doing all for Jesus. We'll be doing all that we can for His cause. If you're here today and there's something that you need to get right with Him, there's something in your life that you're placing before the Lord, I ask that you come down here to an old-fashioned altar and make that right with the Lord. you got a need or anything, come on down here talk to God. Prayer works. I'm living proof that prayer works. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for this day, Lord. We thank You for Your many blessings. Lord, I thank You for...